In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. A warm welcome to you. Welcome to the 13th edition of We Make the City Reset. From now on, according to Marco de Brummelstroet. We are going to talk today uh, about uh, the streets, the future of our streets. What do we want to use them for? Do we want to go from A to B in the most efficient way? Or do we need them to meet each other? Do we need them to park our car? Do we need to use them to make our cities greener and rainproof? Uh, do we need them to let our children play? We'll see how the design of our streets is political and we'll invite you to think on the possible futures for our streets. Our main guest today is Marco de Brummelstrud, who is an associate professor in urban planning. And later on in the program, we will be joined through Zoom by Rebecca Karbamer, who is a sustainable mobility coordinator at the city of Bremen. That will happen in a, in a short while. First, I'd like to welcome every viewer on the Pakhuis de Zwerger channel or on the Salto channel. And now I would like to welcome our main guest, Marco de Brummelstoet. Nice to have you here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, as I have learned, you've got a presentation prepared and I would say the floor is yours. Thank you very much. If we want to truly reset the streets, we have to make that fight much more political. Robert Piersig wrote a very interesting novel already in the 70s, and you might have heard of it. It's called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And in the novel, he writes that if a revolution destroys a system, but the patterns of thought that produce the system are left intact, the succeeding system will just repeat the same patterns. And I think this is a key understanding that we need to realize if we start thinking about this crisis that we're in and the system that we want to replace. Because the street can be seen as exactly such a system. The streets, of course, first and foremost, a physical thing, an entity that we all know that has been designed with concrete and with steel. But at the same time, the streets can also be seen as a social construct. So the street is a solidified, uh, a solidified phenomenon that is built on certain patterns of thought. And the street is a very specific, um, a very specific uh, uh, object in that sense. Because on, uh, on, the, on the one hand, it represents the thoughts that are behind it. But since it is also our public space, it is at the same time a condition for our thinking about streets in the second place. So how does this work? We use worldviews and patterns of thought to make sense of a complicated world. We have to do that to simplify that world and to make sense of it, to define problems and to find solutions. But by choosing a specific worldview to present a system such as the street, we also by definition make arbitrary choices in that simplification. And these simplifications and choices will define what we see and what we obscure in our thinking. The image behind me illustrates that point. It is a reality, it's a picture, but you can see this picture as either representing a rabbit or as representing a duck. And both representations of that reality are equally valid. So you cannot say that the rabbit is more true than a duck. But choosing either a duck or a rabbit to describe that reality will make you focus on different parts of that reality and obscure others. So the street is such a system where it happens. It's a very complex system, public space where uh, a lot of things happen at the same time and uh, something that we have to make sense of. So if we look at this picture here, for instance, you can describe it in two radically different ways. One way that we can describe it, and most people do, is that we see a child trying to cross the street in the rain on a zebra crossing and actually she has right of way. But we could also choose to describe that same reality completely flipped. We can describe this reality as a lot of adults 
that try to put their 900 or 9,000 kilo, kilo vehicles through the living environment of a child. And I would argue that making a choice in, in these two realities will um, profoundly shape what kind of future we will make uh, with the streets in our cities. So how do we actually see the street? Well, this is the point where I think it's important to make it political. The street and mobility are often seen as a technical, uh, a technical uh, system that is uh, being designed by engineers that have been uh, thought uh, models, guidelines and norms to design that space. And by doing that, we basically depoliticized it. Traffic engineers have their uh, the models, guides uh, and, uh, and norms inspired by fields such as uh, physics, uh, the gravitational models or friction models uh, and economics. So I want to take out two key metaphors that I used to describe this picture behind me, which we know as an intersection, but could also be seen as public space. So how do we describe in these norms and guidelines and models this space? Well, there's two key terms that are used uh, to actually design this system. And the most important one here is the, the idea that a human is a homo economicus. So a human in traffic engineering is represented as an egoistic, a calculating individual who maximizing, maximizes his or her personal utility. And you do that by going to places where you have utility, where there are activities that you can do that give you more utility than staying at home. This is why we want to go from A to B. And this is why in that model, mobility is a derived demand. In economic terms, mobility even is worse than a derived demand. It is a disutility, something that you want to minimize. You actually want to be either at A or at B. And being mobile is something that you want to discount as much as possible. So this puts our mind already in the frame that every individual on this intersection wants to minimize his or her travel time. And that brings us at the same time to the second key metaphor here, is that the streets that we see here are basically seen as a water system, a system that can never stop free flowing. As soon as free flow is hampered, this in traffic engineering is considered to be a problem. So this makes this intersection a question of reducing conflict. We want people to be able to minimize their disutility, uh, to minimize the cost of being on the way. And you can only do that by taking out all the conflict and friction uh, that happen around them. And mind you, this is an important political choice because everything else has to go. Children can no longer play here. People can no longer meet each other. They can no longer trade here. Uh, they can no longer uh, negotiate and mingle. So we are at an important time in history with current COVID-19 crisis and the lockdown and responses by government. And people say this, that only a crisis produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And this is often seen as sort of a, a potential victory uh, for alternatives for the car. So let us look at some of these alternatives that are lying around. One of them is using the street in a radically different way. This comes from the city of Ghent in Belgium, and it's called the Leefstraat or the Living Street, where the idea is that at least for a certain period of time, citizens are allowed to retake their street and to use it in a radically different way. In this case, to meet each other and to use it as public space with cars that were parked there, are parked elsewhere, and other mobility options are put forward. And indeed, we see that in this crisis, this idea is taken up and scaled up in many different contexts. Amsterdam was already, uh, already uh, preparing for this and already experimenting with the, the living street. But also, if you look at the, the recent experiments, we saw that this put forward the idea that even a living street is a very political tool because people were not all enthusiastic about this. There were winners and there were losers. So let us look at another example. The school street, the Schoolstraat. Again, an example that is taken uh, in the Dutch context, at least from the Belgium context, and actually was founded, the idea was founded in Italy. So the school street, basically what it does, it gives back the street in front of a school to the people that go there, the students, the pupils, the children. 
But again, you see here that there's a huge political contestation because what you do actually is you, you retract the street from its original purpose and you put in another purpose, which for many people makes a lot of sense, but there's always a lot of uh, friction and contention, contention as well. And finally, a new kid on the block is the holiday street, the Vakantiestraat, because we all have to stay at home, or many of us uh, are staying at home uh, during this holiday season. The idea originating in Rotterdam was why can we not use the street as a place to have our holiday this year? And again, the idea is similar. We take a, a street and we close it off or open it to the audience, to the people that live there, and we allow them to put different kinds of objects on the street and use it in a different way. All great examples that put pressure on the existing way of using the system of the street. However, I think we need to ask ourselves the question, is the underlying pattern of thought really different from what we were doing beforehand? And if not, what are the alternatives? Let me explain a few. As I said, one of the underlying rationales or patterns of thought that underlies the way that we observe and design our streets is the idea of the homo economicus. And as already written in this great book by Kate Rayward, this is a model that is under severe pressure, especially within economics, because we see that people are not, not only rational economic men that only uh, look for their own utility, but they're actually quite altruistic. Uh, and it makes much more sense to see men and women as a group of people that want to strive uh, for the common good, socially adaptable humans. So what would happen if we use such a different pattern of thought to design our streets? Another example is the homo ludens, uh, an idea actually from the late 19th century uh, by Johan Huizinga, which claims that a part of, of, of who humans are, are people that are become uh, satisfied by playing. And playing here means playing in the, uh, the widest sense of the, of the word, means doing something which has no utility. It has no utility whatsoever. It's doing something for the sake of doing it. So again, ask yourself the question, what would change if we use this model to look at our streets? And a third model could be the homo faber, an idea also post, uh, posited by uh, Richard Sennett in his book about the ethics of the city. The homo faber is the part of the human that becomes satisfied by making things either him or herself or, or making something uh, together with others. These are just three different examples of looking at different parts of the human, the human being, uh, as different patterns of thought, different worldviews that could also lead to radically different ways of seeing uh, how we can design public space. One example that I think comes very close to this is the Dutch example from the 80s, which is, is called the Woon Erf or Woon Earth, uh, and also used a lot around the world. However, uh, not used anymore in the Netherlands. Uh, this is an example where the street became a place of living. So it's, not, it's no longer even called a street. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Erf, and Erf means an extension of the home. This led to a radically different understanding of the street where uh, children, playing children, were the dominant factor, and car drivers were allowed in, but only if they were driving slower uh, than uh, the speed of a walking child. But you could see here also the pressure that it put, that is put on the system, and actually by traffic engineers, uh, was replaced with a 30 kilometer zone, because it fitted better with their existing patterns of thought. Because can you imagine the loss of travel time in such a street? So, what we have to do here uh, is an idea proposed, I think, by Donella Meadows. And Donella Meadows reasoned that um, if we want to understand how our patterns of thought define what we do and do not see if we look at the street, uh, she proposes to develop an attitude which she called um, a going beyond paradigms. And the idea is very simple. There's an object behind me, and that object can be seen from one angle, and then we see the map of the United States of America. But if you start walking around that object, the same object becomes a very different symbol. In this case, the symbol of a gun. And the point that Donella Meadows make, makes is not that this perspective is per definition better than the perspective we held before, 
but the point that we become aware that there are different perspectives to look at the same reality and by using these different perspectives we actually enrich our understanding of it. So, to close off, if we really want to reset the way that we deal with streets, we have to do three things. One, we have to make it much more a political process. Two, we have to challenge the mainstream patterns of thought that underlie it. And three, we have together staying and developing the art of looking for alternative patterns of thought. If you want to join us in doing that, there's already an ongoing uh, group of people which is called geefdestraatterug.nl, give the street back, where all, all, already over 3,000 Dutch citizens have claimed their streets back from traffic engineering logic. And we are currently trying to organize that. A second way to do that is uh, written in a book together with Talia Fakade, which also tries to explore where the patterns of thought and the worldviews of traffic engineering came from and how our alternatives can work to uh, replace them with better alternatives. And last but not least, since today we developed a MOOC, a massive open online course, which is a free course on Coursera, where you can learn what is necessary and required to reclaim your street. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, very interesting to hear. Uh, what I wondered when you were talking about uh, uh, the streets and that the streets are political, um, there are many trends in policy that change quickly. The Wone Erf, like you described, is one of them. Um, we're heading to a carless city. Isn't that just a trend that will pass on in a couple of years as well? Well, I actually, um, I had a, an, an interview a couple of days ago where I uh, talked about this, uh, this phenomenon as uh, the idea that because of the current crisis, we see that cars are pushed and pushed further outside of the city, the city center, I have to say. Uh, and I referred to it as, as, the, as the metaphor of the, the elephant is pushed out of the room and suddenly we see uh, how pale the, the, the carpet is and how, how we neglected the, uh, the, the entire uh, design of the room. But I think that as soon as this logic will return, we will quickly uh, forget it because the underlying patterns of thought, so the idea, for instance, that uh, travel time savings are so important for society that everything has to go out of the way for it, this pattern will, will regain uh, traction as soon as the economic uh, um, uh, recovery is going to get started. And that means a return of the car again? Yes, because I, th I think also that we shouldn't see the car as something bad and the bicycle as something good. But the car as a symbol of a, of a way of thinking where we put the individual and the individual idea of traveling as something that should be as seamless as possible for you, for the individual, uh, as the, the key goal. And if you follow that logic, you will automatically get to the car, right? So the car is just a symbol that's sort of the end point uh, of, uh, well, actually the next end point is of course the self-driving car that even makes it even, even easier to go from A to B. So I think the only way to challenge that is to challenge the, the whole concept of the street being a place that you want to go as fast as possible through. Right. Maybe it's also a place that you want to actually spend your time on and friction is something that gives value to life. Right. And a lot of what you say is based on perception. As soon as we change the perception of what we think a car is or a, what we think a street is, then we can change the use of it as well and change our mentality. Yeah, and especially here, and that's the, sort of the, the more abstract part, the idea of what mobility is. Mm -hmm. So we have been uh, in, in this process for decades, actually almost 100 years. And Ivan Illich, uh, a philosopher from the 70s, called this a, a radical monopoly. So we have been so trained and so ingrained in the system of mobility being something that is disutility, uh, that we can no longer see that there's an alternative. So think about it, that every half an hour on every radio station, we hear about congestion on the highways. Only 15% of the people in the Netherlands experience that, but everybody has to hear it every half an hour. There's no problem as big that it deserves so much attention on the radio, apparently, as congestion. This, uh, and seeing this as normal, that's, the, uh, that's a sign that we have been entrenched in a, a radical monopoly. I think one way to get out of that is to, to, uh, to allow ourselves to see that there are different ways of looking at mobility and there are different ways, radical different ways, of looking at the street. Who has to lead that conversation? Well, that's, that's uh, very interesting. So I, as I said, I think it needs to be political. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and I've been thinking about that for, for a long time. First, my first answer was uh, other disciplines. So where's the sociologist? Where's the ecologist? Uh, where's the, uh, the child expert? Uh, but then uh, the next step, step in thinking was, well, where are the political parties? Why are political parties not positioning themselves as in radical different ideas of mobility? And now I'm actually at the point where I think, well, the real polit politics starts with the citizens. So we should train citizens uh, to uh, see the street as something important. It shapes who you are and how you relate to others. Uh, it shapes what, what happens with you as soon as you leave your doorstep. And you should think about it. You should make uh, a, stand, a standpoint uh, in it. And only then political parties will follow and then uh, the disciplines will follow as well. So the ball's in our court. It, uh, definitely, yeah, I think so. Well, in the, in the court of citizens. And then that's, that's one of these issues is that uh, if you have never trained yourself to, to allow yourself to think that there's something uh, political out there, because uh, it seems that the street, for many people, it seems that the street is just something, uh, it's, it's taken for granted, it's just there. Mm. It's how it's designed, their norms, their models, they're these experts. But if you tell them, well, these experts, they, are, they have three years of training, a sort of a, a foreign language, the traffic language, that's it. They're, they're desperately looking for you to tell them what to do. Yeah, and we have to reclaim the cities or reclaim the, 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 the ownership of the cities or, or the streets almost. Yeah, well, if we don't do that for our public space, uh, what is our city? Yeah. Um, you've just written a book, Het Recht van de Snelste. Uh, what's the book about? Yeah, so, so the, the, the title would translate as The Right of the Fastest. And uh, it is actually about uh, politicizing uh, this, this public space. And on the most, most abstract level, it's about showing people how uh, depoliticizing something, uh, so turning something very quickly into guidelines and norms and models, is actually a problem. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a problem not only for public space, but for many of the items that we discuss. But especially on the street, this place where, which has become uh, a space where uh, increasingly we try to avoid conflict, uh, which is, is a very problematic uh, space where this happens. And as exactly as I just as we just discussed, because this is the place where it's public space. So this is where society happens and society thrives uh, by conflict and by friction. And as soon as we think about a frictionless city where nobody is, uh, is uh, negotiating or in interaction with each other anymore, I think we have lost the battle. But what, what, why do you state that society thrives by conflict? Because everybody dreams of peaceful coexistence instead yeah. of conflict. Why yeah, does society thrive by it? That's, that's the way that we move forward. We have always moved forward. And, and conflict doesn't necessarily have to mean evil conflict or, or violence. Uh, good conflict is, uh, is, uh, is also, we, we can uh, debate, we have a dialogue, we have a negotiation, we can win, we can lose. Uh, if we don't have interaction, we can also not be altruistic, right? You can only be altruistic to another person uh, by the virtue of having that opportunity to be altruistic. As soon as you design it out of the system. So think about it, if, if all of the people in Amsterdam would be in self-driving Pods, and the algorithm would sort everything, mm -hmm. and Google would promise you a seamless travel from A to B. Think about what that would mean for meeting other people, um, having a, uh, what we call the potential exposure to diversity. Sociologists also do a lot of research on this exposure to, to the other, mm -hmm. uh, so people that are different from you, places that are different from you, and all the benefits that's, that this ha has in terms of uh, mutual trust, sense of place, sense of belonging. And these are all elements that are currently designed out of the system because we, uh, we look at the rabbit, so we forget about the duck. Right. Yeah. Um, in our podcast on the Pakhuis de Zwijger website, you talked about a schoolyard. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, because there was yeah. a lot of space for, for, the, for the children and a little, uh, just not enough space for the cars, and those are, that's changing now, right? Well, it's, it's the exact opposite. The other way around, yeah. yeah. But the, the problem there was also, uh, if you talk to all the stakeholders, that they accepted it, they took it for granted. So what happened, they, they started this process for a new school in a very uh, um, uh, family-friendly neighborhood. Uh, and then the first plan that they got uh, on the table uh, had a huge kiss and ride facility uh, in it. So that was 1,100 square meters was a kiss and ride facility for car drivers to bring their children and then uh, move out of the way safely. So basically, that's the best solution that a traffic engineer can make if you want to move children safely through a car environment. So I told them, but what if you ask people uh, the question, how can we get cars out of the way of the environment where children live? That suddenly flipped the board. So before we had three square meters of playground for children, in total 700 square meters. 
1,100 square meters for car drivers. Uh, and now we flipped it, because basically because we said, let's make it political. Let's ask people in the neighborhood what they want. 85% of the people uh, in the neighborhood didn't want the kiss and ride, but they also thought it was just a, a, a matter of fact. It was a stated fact. There is a kiss and ride because that's the safest way that we can do it. And now we are two years in the process. It's deeply political. There's a lot of tension and conflict. Uh, but I think that uh, it makes also our society thrive. And now we have our children have actually, well, they had a, the same amount of space as a biological chicken per, per child. And now we doubled that. So I think nobody wants to go back from that uh, in a couple of years. Right. And to include other perceptions, other perspectives into that conversation, and uh, not only the experts, so to speak, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important. Yeah, and here again, the, my first uh, response was like, well, why was the traffic engineer the, the only expert on the table? By the way, he still is. Mm. We are two years in the process and we, we still only talk with the, uh, the traffic engineer. But uh, I think the point that I just also, we discussed, right? It's, it's, not, it's not only about the domains or the disciplines, it's what, where were the, 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 the neighbors? Yeah. What, why were there not more people uh, politicizing this, contesting this, saying we don't want this, we want A, we don't want B. And then we also have, we have neighbors who say, 15% say, I want, to have, uh, I want to have it as was designed, which is fine. So let's have a, an argu argument. So now we actually have a temporary situation, a pilot, yeah. where we try out if this works or not, because also for them it should work. It's also their public space. And I think having this friction in the process early on to discuss openly that we have this new space, how do we want to design it, instead of just giving it away to the traffic engineer, uh, I think was a huge win. Right. So conflict, friction, conversation might end up with a new design that will benefit more people. Or, or not. Uh, or not. <laughs> um, thank you for now. Um, talking about participatory design, uh, our next guest is an expert in participatory design, uh, Rebecca Karlbaumer. She's joining us through Zoom. Rebecca, are you there? I am, hello. Hello, very Hi. warm welcome to you. Um, you're the Sustainable Mobility Coordinator in Bremen. And uh, in 2014, um, the citizens of Bremen approved a new mobility plan for the city in 2025, right? For 2025, yes. It was a, um, a unanimous uh, sustainable urban mobility plan passed by our city parliament um, with it laid out a 10 year strategy for Great. development and mobility in the city. Great. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later, but mm -hmm. first we'll watch a clip introducing you. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was a very dynamic clip of the Sampo Ward. Uh, Rebecca, that would explain a little bit what the plans are in Bremen, am I right? Yes, correctly. Um, that was made in 2014 when Bremen was nominated for the um, SUMP award for our you know, sustainable urban mobility plan and in particular also the participation process um, that we carried out over two years really extensively with local stakeholders as well as citizens in a variety of formats. And how did it work to include other voices into the conversation? Was the city of Bremen prepared to do that or do, did they need to have to, to be convinced a bit? 
Um, no, absolutely not. Um, that is, I guess, a quintessential um, element of creating a sustainable urban mobility plan is to engage your local community, um, those public decision makers, um, you know, clubs, local stakeholders, um, as well as the citizens. Um, only that way can you can create a long-term strategy that will actually work and meet the needs of of citizens as well as businesses. Mm. And we'll talk a little bit more about those participatory trajects, trajectories uh, in a bit. But yeah. first, you heard Marco's st presentation as well. What is your first reaction to his story? Oh, my first reaction to his story is that I, I definitely agree with his um, approach. Um, I mean, while we see uh, politicians slowly starting to think more about um, a more sustainable transport future for our cities, um, car-free city centers, for instance, our, our um, party coalition in, in Bremen also agreed that by 2030, we want our city center to be entirely car-free. Um, and while there are still discussions around, you know, what is a car-free city center and how is that going to work, um, it's quite clear that um, our developments are going in that direction. Um, however, when you engage with citizens on the street, for instance, personal conversation that I have with my neighbors, um, then the notion is still quite quite different. It's very much a, a matter of semantics and and mindset, even in people who are living on these overcrowded streets, over, overcrowded in the sense of there being too many cars in a limited um, amount of space. So um, I certainly agree with Marco that um, this political discussion also needs to start with the citizens. And it's very simply um, changing the, the mindset around what is a fair use of public space? You know, what are our rights um, around the space? And getting um, local residents to think outside of that that box as well. Mm. Uh, not lo no longer think about Gewohnheitsrecht is what we call it in German. Um, so like customary practice, um, customary law, and to also get them to to question um, the use of of that public space um, that they've become so used to, but is in a sense, um, entirely people unfriendly. Right. Uh, the introduction of new plans always have winners and losers. Uh, when you talk about a car-free city of Bremen, who are the losers in that plan? Um, the losers, I wouldn't define them as uh, anybody as a loser. Um, it's certainly a, a period of transition will be challenging for for a number of, of actors and um, some of those who for whom that transition, especially the, that mental transition, may be a little bit more difficult is um, is the businesses. But in a long term, um, they also serve to to profit. Um, so I wouldn't define it as as winners or losers, but those who perhaps have. Um, it may be a bit more challenging to adjust to changes. And sometimes, the there's, sometimes there's a physical challenge as well, because in Amsterdam there was always a discussion about taking cars away. And what you hear, heard is that the elderly are very um, against that proposition because people will not easy, as easily visit them, but their own mobility is limit, limited as well. So how mm -hmm. did the elderly react to the plan of, of, of in Bremen? Um, that's that's a good question um, and one that I'm not sure I can I can answer. Um, certainly, those um, concerns were were considered. I mean, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan covers a, a lot of different measures. There are over 100, 200 different measures in 12 um, priority areas. So that goes all the way from from strategies, overarching umbrella strategies, to very concrete. Um, infrastructure measures. So within those those plans laid out in the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan, um, there will be consultations, um, again, to deal with um, issues of, of different, especially minorities in the public realm, um, when it comes to designing specific measures. Right. Um, awareness is a big part of uh, the campaign in order to get citizens more involved. How did you go about to bring about awareness and then the right knowledge in order to have people have the, the, the right information to make the right decisions? Mm -hmm. Um, so when engaging the private citizens, um, our colleagues took um, a really broad approach to the public participation process. Um, you know, the classic participation form are those evening meetings where you um, talk about ideas, um, opportunities and, and risks and, and challenges in the public um, realm. 
But those also th those are very important, but they also tend to very attract a very specific type of citizen. Um, sometimes we call them the professional citizens. So um, on average, retired males, you know, over the age of 65, um, whose perspective is important, but it's not representative of all um, groups of society. So um, in addition to those um, classic public consultations, um, the city of Bremen also carried out very extensive online um, consultation. Um, an image was just shown of, of a map where um, citizens were able to um, yeah, comment directly on, on you know, problems or challenges that they saw or, or also comment on things they liked and you had a chance to, to like or, um, or disagree with, um, with those comments. Um, that was carried out over quite a long time. Um, in a second phase where we um, were talking about different development scenarios um, in Bremen, uh, we did a very um, you know, yeah, participation process that was very similar you know, to gamification. So by allowing, um, it, was, it was an online game. We also had an offline game that we set up at um, malls in, in the region where citizens were able to choose their favorite measures and then get points for considering different um, different needs of different traffic participants. And that was a great way um, also to communicate the complexity of transport planning and how difficult it is to make everybody happy yeah. in, at the same time. In your experience, did citizens come up with better solutions or better ideas than the experts? Um, they they often do. Um, we experts are often stuck in our own you know bubble and sometimes limited by our expertise or, or blinded by our expertise. Um, Can you give an example and, of it? Um, one example is um, so in the city of Bremen, I'm responsible for planning mobility hubs, so car share stations um, in the public realm that also link to different transport modes. And um, in one instance, um, we had we had plans that we had discussed with the neighborhood initiative and in the uh, district parliament, and um, it caused massive protest, um, really massive protest with petitions. Um, I was uh, you know, my favorite insult I've received to date. I was called an eco dictator. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in the end, out of all that conflict, um, the, the neighborhood came up with an alternative suggestion, an alternative site um, for that mobility hub. And in the end, it really ended up being better, um, a better location, more visible, um, better for the mobility providers. And it was one of those solutions that it made everybody happy. Um, and we were flexible enough that we changed our designs in the location and um, adapted you know, to the needs of the neighborhood. So. Great to hear that. Um, yeah. my, my final question for you now is, um, when we asked you for a quote beforehand, you said, um, from now on, transport planners must think beyond the rim of their teacup. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Um, well, it's, it's something that Marco um, mentioned in his presentation as well, that um, traffic design is often limited by those, those norms and guidelines, um, figures, numbers, um, get out your measuring tape. And um, in order to make you know, quality spaces, we often have to think beyond, beyond those. Um, I mean, there's there's a reason for them, but it doesn't mean that we have to to limit our design simply to that. Um, and it's something I really try to take to to heart very much when I'm approaching you know the planning of a new mobility hub or um, advising and housing developments, is to take other um, aspects into consideration other than moving people and vehicles. It's also about, you know, quality of space, um, social inclusion. We can consider um, aspects of um, climate ad adaptation and resilience and, and biodiversity so that something as simple as a small um, mobility hub and a city can, can become a um, interdisciplinary um, holistic plan. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd like to see so much more um, in the realm of traffic planners. I, I don't understand yeah. that. How, how difficult was it to make them look beyond the rim of their teacup? It, <laughs> um, it can be a challenge sometimes, but it obviously always depends on, on who you're sitting across the table with and how you approach um, new ideas. Um, so I, I find it most challenging when I'm, you know, working with traffic planners um, who studied in the 1960s and 1970s. They still have a very <laughs> automobile-centric way of, of, of planning and thinking. Um, other other planners are much more more open. So um, 
even on a planning planning level, if we take a collaborative approach and and a bit of a brainstorming and experimental approach, um, it's it's a bit easier to to get them to think beyond the the rim of that teacup, and um, everybody's proud of the end result then. Great, thank you so much. It's a generational teacup, I, I understand. <laughs> we will return to you in, in a bit, but I would like to continue your conversation for now with you, Marco, because you brought uh, two clips that you wanted to show. Yeah. Uh, do we need an introduction for the first clip, or shall we just watch it? Let's, let's just watch it. Let's look at the first yeah. clip. Well, it's quite clear what we saw. We saw Paris, the street of Paris, in 2012 and 2020. A huge difference, less cars, more cyclists, but you still cannot cross the streets. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so this, this uh, clip is heralded as, uh, look look at what, uh, what change can occur if uh, politicians stand behind it, and it does. Eh? It, it shows, for instance, in terms of sustainable urban mobility, uh, it's it's a huge leap that uh, Paris is making, and a leap that I think uh, uh, is so big that it will not re it will not return to uh, the, um, the the old ways of, of doing. But uh, exactly it, what, so so I like to look at these clips and then uh, try to uh, develop the skill of dancing with paradigms, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Donella Meadows' idea. And then indeed, what you see is that some people say, well, this street is is maybe even become become worse. Mm -hmm. So I can now not even. I, I could cross the street uh, because with car traffic, I, I knew how to deal with that. But now there's so much traffic on that street. Uh, and although it's more sustainable, it, it's, not, it's not making the street more fair or more just because I still cannot cross it. And, I can, and still children cannot go on it uh, by themselves and so on and so forth. So it, it shows again to me, it shows um, the elephant is out of the room. We see now what the change is possible. But I hope that we also also develop the skill of, but what are the limits here? Is this street really taking back justice uh, as it was before the car came uh, and i doubt it but um if you too would, would take another step into the future if you would develop the street in another way is the way to involve more voices in order to reclaim the streets well how should we go about it yeah so i'm, I'm a social scientist so I, I don't answer how questions <laughs> <laughs> too <But> easy <laughs> yeah it's easy the, the idea here is also when i listen to the story in Bremen, is first of all uh, applaud what's happening there and and celebrate the huge achievements that that we win but then of course it's my task to start asking asking the, the tough questions again so f f the first the first thing that i saw there was why do we why do we talk about sustainable urban mobility places? So if, if I ask you how is your marriage going, mm -hmm. and your answer is it's sustainable, I really doubt if it's going well, right? So <laughs> so what are the goals that we want to achieve with the city? I mm -hmm. really like the example in, in also in a book of uh, Mechelen in, in, in Belgium. They call themselves the child city. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, the rest follows. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what I think uh, that is a, is a next step in terms of process would be to not only engage citizens in terms of uh, mobility plan and then asking them to pinpoint measures and what they do and, and do not like, but I would really like to engage with them in a, in a, in a quest and a brainstorm about the goals. So what do you want the street to be? Uh, and I often feel that we are not yet willing to go there to really but ask them. But let's pose that question to Rebecca. What are the goals, Rebecca, in order to change Bremen? What, what's, the, what's the biggest goal? And besides sustainability, that's um, I mean a big, big uh, or difficult question to to answer um, and simple at the same. Obviously, this, uh, environmental sustainability and economic sustainability, um, but a large portion of the um, SUMP is also designed around around fairness, um, so safety, and and accessibility. Um, of the space. Um, the question of if that can be achieved overall for the city is, you know, down to the individual measures. Um, and you're right, I mean, to, to think about what kind of city do we actually want to live in? 
And what goal is that for Bremen? What kind of city wants it to be in in 2025? Mm -hmm. Well, socially equitable, um, affordable, um, fair, one with one with clean air and and clean streets, um, and that allows people to go around their their daily business and meet their needs, uh, and in a safe and economical um, way that is. Um, easy uh, on the environment. No, but I think that one of the issues I have with that is that nobody would be against that, right? So the, the list mm. that you just listed, of course, everybody wants yeah. to have a, a safe and, and thriving and, and socially just city. Mm. The, yeah. the, the, the question is, especially in public space, these, mm. these goals cannot all be met. They are in conflict for the same mm. space. So you cannot have, uh, for instance, you cannot have fast uh, mobility and safety. We have 1.3 million people dying currently uh, on our streets. So why are pol political parties or citizens not uh, um, making clear what they really want instead of, uh, yes, we want everything to be better. Okay, but if you have to choose between two of these things, uh, that mm -hmm. could be an interesting brainstorm. Uh, yeah. Asking people, look, you have to choose between either. That's what uh, some some uh, academics in, in Delft uh, did. They asked them, really, people as citizens, do you think s uh, safety is more important than uh, your own travel But let's time? ask Rebecca, what is it that mm -hmm. you really want? Well, um, I, just to, to go back to what Marco said, I think um, it was really important when uh, Bremen's SUMP was being developed that it be um, a consensus uh, in the end, um, you know, that all parties are able to agree and to, to carry on and stick with these goals for the next 10 years. But is that possible, uh, and, Marco? And, and is the consensus is, yeah, is, is, is this creating consensus? a consensus um, creating the best the best end result? Yeah, You're but right. is, 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 is that a goal in itself, consensus, or is it is it is it in conflict of, of different things you would, that you yeah, would like well, to achieve? You, you of course want to achieve a certain uh, uh, level of consensus, but I think one of the things that we need to do is is uh, is, uh, is do much more and then see what are the benefits and uh, and also the drawbacks because we're not very good at that. We measure mm -hmm. a lot of the the benefits often of plans, mm -hmm. but the perverse effects are often uh, not well measured. And one way to do that is to just practice a lot mm -hmm. and then learn a lot because now having consensus front with everybody i would say that that's uh, uh, that could become a weakness of because what you're not choosing then apparently mm. uh, because if everybody mm. agrees on something then uh, it's too good to be true <laughs> whenever that, that's a good thing to remember uh, everyone everybody agrees on something it's too good to be my, true. My, my father always said if something is too good to be true it probably is <laughs> that's what oprah winfrey says as well so oh, the, the two minds think alike yeah. um uh, with to, on to our next clip because uh, sometimes you would like to regulate a lot of things but let's see when you do don't do that. Let's have a look at our uh, clip that was being produced by National Geographic. What we see here, Marco, is a swarm of sterlings. And why would you want to show us this clip? Because this, this uh, well, not this uh, swarm, but the swarms of starlings always um, impressed me, and I think many people. And they, they, they have a certain sense of awe because we don't know how they do it, and we definitely don't know why they do it. Uh, and in Amsterdam, we also have a lot of them. And uh, at one day, not being a traffic engineer and standing with uh, another person not being a traffic engineer at the side of a road, and uh, we had a, a, an interview for a local newspaper, uh, and we started just to observe. And at, at that moment, the traffic lights were broken. And what mm. we saw was actually something that uh, uh, was very alike this swarm of starlings. Mm. But what made it for me very interesting is that so uh, if you then start looking at cyclists, cycling behavior, you see that cyclists can actually do this. But the, the, the design of the place where they were doing it was not designed in this logic. And this, this was for me the first time that I thought, wait a minute, there's actually an underlying metaphor and I, I, I coined that the, the, the uh, f, um, uh, so this is the swarm of starlings and actually the streets are designed for the flock of geese. Mm. So it's basically designed uh, for these large uh, plump objects that have to go from A to B that need clear rules, otherwise they collide. And this metaphor could teach us a thing or two mm. if we look at the cycling citizens of Amsterdam. And what we see here is the space behind the central station called the shared space, yeah. which was being introduced as a place that didn't have any strict rules, no yeah. lines where the streets went, no um, 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 no boxing off of where the cyclists and, and, and citizens and, and pedestrians had, had to go. Yeah. 
Um, how does this function? Does this function as a swarm of well, sterlings? Do you think? see it? This was even with roadworks. Yeah, it, it's it functions. Uh, in the old term uh, traffic engineering logic, it functions. At first, they said this is not possible because it, you create more conflict. You which create is chaos. Yeah, and we have our tools that say more conflicts is bad, less conflict is good. Uh, so you create chaos indeed. Uh, and then, uh, so w one thing that really is important here to consider is that there's no uh, or very little motorized traffic. Okay? Mm. So this is all people w with their uh, human powered vehicles walking or, scooters. or cycling. Scooters, there are scooters. There's some scooters, but they also go relatively slow there. Uh, and then you see that you create conditions where the swarm uh, of starlings can start, because it's one of the points that people say there are no rules. You, 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 you rightfully said there's no strict rules, but there's a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. there's no, I, I was just there. Uh, and there's one rule is that you do not put your foot on the ground. That's the key rule. So you keep on moving because while moving, you're able to negotiate. This is why all these people in Amsterdam sit up straight on their bicycle. <laughs> which is against all homo economical laws because you will never win the Tour de France sitting up upright on a bicycle. But it allows you to do all this negotiation. Mm. So why is this so interesting? Uh, not because this is a better model, but because this model shows that the existing model is limited. It yeah. does the, the traffic engineering uh, book doesn't help us to understand how uh, other people use mobility, but also uh, doesn't give us a lot of clues on why. And here we see that this space is a lot of... Uh, uh, why? There's here is the potential exposure to diversity, negotiation between citizens, mm. a much higher sense of place, a sense of belonging, uh, a development of mutual trust. These are all m uh, mini uh, negotiations. And, and, and most importantly, I think, is responsibility. You are given and yeah. trusted the, re the responsibility that no accident will happen. Well, and if they happen, you, uh, it's not lethal. So mm. this is also a place where you can learn. Uh, and the only thing that can be uh, uh, injured is your ego. Right. Uh, and a little bit your bike. But you get up and you learn. And next time you think, oh, I need to be a bit more careful, but a bit less careful. And this learning, again, in the, in the, flock of star in the swarm of starlings, is a very important element. Is that it's very inclusive. It's very actually very... Uh, um, very fair system. It allows also the weak uh, starlings to be in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, and they are being protected by the uh, by the by the swarm. And all these elements are currently not in the book of traffic engineering. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole point here. By just taking a different metaphor, looking at the system from a different angle, uh, I hope to uh, engage traffic engineering or or uh, all the people that are deal dealing with the streets to to rethink. Hey, wait a minute, we are missing certain elements, and let's start including them. Right, Rebecca. Um, in the city of Bremen, you do the same thing in regard to responsibility as well, because you include uh, citizens, you include citizens' voices, and you do give them responsibility. Would a shared space principle be possible, do you think? Just a ru a, 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 like less rules, more experiment, and a room to fail as well? Well, certainly. I mean, we have uh, certain derivatives of shared space in the city of Bremen already. Um, you know, spaces in front of the main train station where you have passengers pouring in and out of the railway station, heading to the bus and tram stops directly across. Um, that was intercrossed by by cyclists. So um, we have um, some formal uh, forms of that as well. Or um, in our city center um, pedestrian area that also features trams and is able to cycle through it in, in some spaces or um, in the Spielstraßen, what we call the so playing playing streets. Mm. Um, well, what is it in your experience is the result of that, if you call that an experiment, what, what's the result of it? What can we learn in Amsterdam from what you've been practicing already in Bremen? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want to say that Amsterdam um, can learn from Bremen on this, the, the issue of shared space. Um, Amsterdam can certainly learn from us on, on other issues. Um, <laughs> now I'm very interested in what you mean by that. <laughs> well, I think uh, the, the issue of car, uh, car sharing um, and, and mobility hubs have had quite a few dialogues with um, the city of Amsterdam and um, and the progress they're, they're making there. Mm. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, because no, not 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 to not to anywhere. It's about mutual respect. Um, all of all of those individuals that are moving in that space. Great. Not to skip from one subject to the other, but car sharing is a topic that you mentioned. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a big plan in Bremen to 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 realize that. And even with the COVID nineteen crisis, you were still able to meet your goals, right? Uh, yes, we're very close. Well, we will meet our goals of having 20,000 car share users by the year 2020. Uh, not this July, as we had planned, um, but by December, um, probably. Those um, are goals that were laid out in our car share action plan in 2009. 
Um, and as far as we know, it was the first uh, in Europe um, where a municipality said car sharing is a good alternative to private car ownership and a way for reducing um, private cars in the city. And we as a city are going to promote that actively. Um, through a number of measures. And um, we did that through, obviously, um, integrating car sharing into our own municipal um, activities uh, and, you know, daily life. So we uh, walk the walk, not only talk the talk, mm. also integrating it with public transport. Um, but the most important aspects were integrating car sharing into new housing developments and creating policies um, that allow developers to reduce the number of parking spaces um, if they integrate mobility manage management concepts, right. like with car sharing. Was there a benefit yeah. attached to car, the car sharing principle of in, when new areas were being developed? Was there a financial benefit or another benefit in order to stimulate the, the plan? Um, it's it's basically investors can choose um, whether or not to... to um, so, for, for instance, if investors cannot or do not want to build the um, fixed number or required number of parking spaces, they normally pay a fee to the city. That's sort of the model in, in most German um, cities and in, in other parts of Europe as well. Um, in 2013, we integrated the option of dedicating that fee, that investors can dedicate that fee to mobility management. So public transport tickets um, for, their, for their renters and buyers, um, car share memberships, uh, and car sharing stations. And um, that incentive or what we find um, that investors find is that it um, makes the property more attractive and fits into their own sustainability goals. So it's um, also very much an image um, issue as well as a, a selling point um, for new properties. Great. That's that's about changing the narratives uh, uh, about mm -hmm. car and car ownership and changing yeah. narratives of sharing. Uh, thank you so much for now, Rebecca. Uh, because of time restraints, we have to say goodbye for now. But thank you so much for your contribution. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye, uh, Marco. We have we entered the final stages of our conversation. Um, the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, showed us that change is possible when the pressure is high enough. Um, how can we keep the momentum going that uh, we, we, are, we are prepared to change, but how can we make fundamental changes before returning to the new normal or turning the new normal into the old normal? Yeah, I'm not very optimistic about that. Mm. And, and partly that's uh, uh, if you look at all the, the, the theories about how change, radical change, transformative change happens, uh, you need a couple of things. And one thing you need is a landscape pressure, uh, something we had in the 1970s uh, in, uh, throughout Europe, the oil crisis and many environmental crises at the same time. Uh, and uh, that led to change. And now we have a similar landscape pressure, the COVID and the lockdown uh, requirements. However, uh, this was not uh, sufficient for radical change in the 70s. What mm -hmm. we also needed was civic society that was willing to step up and fight for something for decades to come. And I do not see that uh, 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 momentum uh, currently. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we, uh, we, we keep on saying that we need to politicize this now and one way to politicize it is to find a new language, because the language of streets and mobility is deeply depoliticizing as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you mention the word traffic, uh, people fall asleep. It's like, oh, it's uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> whatever, uh, streets and uh, mobility and this, this, this technical thing. So I'm, I'm going, so if, if we, if we uh, learn to, to talk the language about why is it so important to think, rethink public space, then we can gain momentum uh, and, uh, and, and, and maybe get transformative change. Hopefully this conversation will contribute to that and hopefully the politi politicians here will uh, realize the importance of the issue. I surely hope so. Thank you so much for now. Thank you for your contribution. Um, we've come to the end of our program. Uh, if you would like to see more broadcasts, please check in on every Thursday, 8.30, then a new live cast of We Make the City Reset is, Reset is being uh, uh, published. You can watch us through Facebook, through Salto, and in the next edition, our next guest is Gabriela gomez Mond. Very interesting. Um, if you would like to make a contribution in these challenging times to the programs of Pakhuis de Zwijger, that's possible as well. If you go to the site www.deswijger.nl slash pay, you can leave a financial contribution that will benefit the programs directly. This was it up until now. Thank you so much for our, to our guests. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you in the next edition. Bye-bye. <laughs>